If Metroid 1 was the flawed first attempt, Metroid 2 is the weird middle child. It is an improvement over the first, but still archaic and easy to get lost in, which I'll at least accept that they still couldn't do maps because of the hardware that it was on, but it definitely makes a marathon like this harder to get into. A lot of games have what I would call first game syndrome. I doubt I'm the first one to call it that. It's when they don't really know what they want to do the first time around and don't have the development time to polish everything up, but with the sequel, they take what works and improve on it to make something great. Metroid 2 still feels like it's suffering from first game syndrome because it still has a lot of the same issues as the first, even if some of it's improved. Although, I remember really enjoying Metroid 2 when I first played it in like 2012, even if I didn't finish it. While it might be hard to get through for a first timer, I'm not too worried about this one. And hey, there was obviously something good here because it ended up being remade twice. Once by a single fan and once officially. I'll be giving both those their own looks later, but for now, it's time for the return of Samus. Just like the first game, there's no in-game story, but we luckily have a remake to fall back on. Unlike Zero Mission, Samus Returns actually explains what's happening. So after the events of the first game, and I think the Prime games too, they never specified how long Metroid 2 takes place after the first. But anyway, the Galactic Federation sent out an expedition team out to SR388 and figure out this is the whole world of the Metroids. Being the pesky jellyfish that they are, the Federation unanimously agreed that these things need to be eradicated. So they sent Samus out to kill all of them. Yeah, every last one of them. On Game Boy though, you just boot it up and go on your merry way to genocide without any context. All you've got is a counter telling you how many Metroids are left, with a local counter when you pause the game. And boy did Sammy come prepared. She starts off with 30 missiles as opposed to the usual zero. Each missile expansion gives 10 this time as well. And trust me, you'll be needing those because Metroids can only be damaged with missiles. Metroid 2 isn't quite like the first game. Instead of having two main bosses to feed and going back to a central area, you have to hunt down and kill Metroids. So you go from area to area, they all look the same, killing every Metroid in that area until he caused an earthquake, making the lava lower so he can go to the next one. That's it. That's the game. The linearity at least makes it easier to find a way around, because this is the only Metroid I can think of where there's barely any backtracking. There's little reason to actually go back to a previous area. I'm pretty sure everything can be found on your first trip, too. That's really bizarre for a Metroid game. I like going back to old places with new abilities to find new stuff. There's still no map, but the structure makes a map less necessary. Having to keep one smallish area in your short-term memory is much more manageable than having to figure out how to go from place to place in a non-linear order. So while I don't really like the new structure of the game that much, I'll at least forgive it for the system limitations. If they really couldn't put in a map, then making it more linear was definitely the right move. Especially since this thing was on a Game Boy. You can make your own maps on the NES when you're at home, but good luck doing that on a bus or something without looking like a crazy person. And because this was on Game Boy, they had to redesign Samus a bit due to the lack of color. The Voyage suit still doubles your defense, but now she's got the weird ass shoulder pads we all know and love. The arm cannon has a different barrel when it's in missile mode too. I always like the redesign. Just having a color swap felt weird. Wait, if it was on Game Boy, then why is it in color? Well, I loaded it up in MGBA and it just had color and it didn't look bad, so I played the whole game like that. Metroid 2 apparently had Super Game Boy support, so it has color palettes coded in. It's not native color like Link's Awakening DX or Pokemon Gold and Silver, but it's better than nothing. Seriously, why did Nintendo never emulate this feature? Simulating the OG Game Boy screen is cool and all, but when I can play the game in color, I'd rather do that. The graphics aren't the only things they changed. The controls in general feel smoother. For starters, you can crouch to hit those enemies at knee level without bombs. That does mean that you have to crouch twice to go into Morph Ball, but it's never an issue in any of these games. You can shoot downwards while in the air, too. That's nice. The camera feels too zoomed in, though. The camera does move behind you to let you see further ahead, but enemies can still catch you off guard. I get that it's the Game Boy, but getting hit by enemies that I can barely see is stupid. Maybe that's why I hated these assholes that get in the way of your space jumping or spider balling. At least it makes finally getting the screw attack cathartic as hell. Yeah, let it rip, bitches. Wait, where was I? I don't know. Uh, new abilities, I guess. The spider ball lets you slowly move along walls, and the space jump lets you jump infinitely. It has weird timing to it, though. You have to jump again just as you're falling. I don't really know how to describe it, this is more or less muscle memory to me at this point. I swear, it doesn't always work like it should, and I just end up awkwardly falling back down. It's a pain in the ass. There's the spring ball too, letting you jump while on morph ball so we don't have to rely on bombs. Don't get me wrong, you can do some crazy stuff with morph bombs, but having the option to not use them is really nice and way faster. There's a few new beams too, but aside from the ice beam, they're all kind of the same. I think plasma does the most damage, but wave and spacer might as well not have any difference. 
While they don't stack, there is one hidden place where you can freely choose whichever one you want, but you never need to, which makes me question why this is a thing at all. Start still just pauses the game. I don't understand why you can't just swap them in a menu, seriously. But it's not an issue like in the last game. They more or less give you the ice beam the one time you need it, so they recognize how stupid beam swapping is. Because here's the thing. Your main goal is killing Metroids, which can only be damaged by missiles, so getting a beam upgrade barely means anything. Every other enemy dies in about the same time anyway. And oddly enough, there isn't much else to fight. There's a lot of repeating enemy types, and there aren't even any bosses aside from the few Omega Metroids in the final boss. Seeing how you go from area to area doing the same thing the whole time, the game starts to get repetitive very quickly. It starts to feel less like an adventure and more like a job. Maybe that's what they were going for, but there was a point where it felt like I was doing this simply because I had to. It didn't take long before I started going on autopilot. Most of what you're doing just isn't interesting. It doesn't help that the music in this game sucks. Decent music can make more of a difference than you realize, and there isn't anything here other than the main theme. The overworld theme that plays the sword of the game in the main cave kicks ass. Everything else is just noise. Literally. Like, they were trying to go for ambience, but the Game Boy either couldn't handle that, or they didn't do it properly. Most of the music just ends up sounding like weird bleeps and bloops. Video game music can be incredible, but the music in Metroid 2 sounds like what your grandma thinks video game music sounds like. And the song that plays inside of buildings, it just gets annoying. The only other good track is the credits theme, so there's seriously only like two good songs in this game. That's sad. I really feel that if the music was better, the game wouldn't have felt near as boring, because while you may be doing the same stuff all the time, at least you would have had some good tunes to go along with it. I'm thinking that may be a big reason why I actually enjoyed Pokemon Channel. The music in that game is fire, but in Metroid 2, you're just doing the same stuff all the time with nothing to keep your brain stimulated. It doesn't help with how hilariously easy most Metroids are to kill. They don't get difficult until the third state, I think they're called Zetas. But most of the Alpha and Gamma variety, that go down so easily they border on regular enemy as opposed to mini-boss. Omegas are the only ones that are straight up hard, and even then, that's only because of how hard health is to come by in the areas they show up in. You remember how annoying energy farming was in the first game? Well, they only half fixed it. There was these points that would either fully heal you or replenish all your missiles. But they're in such inconvenient places that they usually fail at what they're supposed to do. They're not right next to a save point or something. They're often at the top of some ravine that you need to use the spider ball to slowly get to to begin with. Or maybe they're in some random cave that's hard to remember how to enter. I swear, some areas don't have these at all, meaning that you either have to backtrack through areas that all look the same, or you have to energy farm anyway. The frustrating part is that they fixed having and do this. It's just that energy rechargers end up in such awkward places that going to them is more trouble than it's worth. But I'll still take only having to do this once or twice over farming whenever I die. At least you start at full health this time, and if you die, you just reload your last save. Pretty standard for a game like this. Oh yeah, this game has save points now, how have I not mentioned that yet? No more having to kill yourself just to save or get your password. But at the end of these annoyances is one last Metroid. You've been through hell hunting down every last one of these bastards, and it's finally time to finish this. You're so far down into the planet that there's nothing here. It really goes to show how deadly these Metroids are. They're so high in the food chain that they're the only things down here. Aside from a world class bounty hunter, of course. So yeah, it's a nice, tranquil walk to the final section, more or less. The calm before the storm, so to speak. They're luckily not mean enough to make you fight the final boss on low health and give you energy and missiles back. The Chozo statue is practically destroyed too, Jesus. At least you got your ice beam for the single time that you actually need it. Because when you go down the final corridor, your Metroid counter starts going up. And yep. More larval Metroids. Ironically, these things are stronger than their Alpha and Gamma counterparts. That never made sense to me. But after killing a few more of them, it's time to take down the Queen. And it's a surprisingly hard fight. You need an obscene amount of missiles to kill this thing, like 160 or something like that. But that's the hard way to do it. Because you're supposed to shoot a missile up its mouth to stun it and lay a bomb in its stomach a few times. I didn't realize that's what you're supposed to do at first, because you have a super small window to actually shoot her in the mouth. But once I saw a video walkthrough, the fight instantly became easy. I went from maybe 15 attempts to 2. It's a fairly standard bomb boss once you figure that out. But weirdly enough, you can actually run away from the fight. I don't know why. Maybe it's so that you can fight her at full health and ammo without having to deal with the enemies in the previous hallway, but that's the only thing I can think of. 
After finishing your genocidal rampage, it turns out there's still one more Metroid, a hatchling. It doesn't even attack you, it's a baby. So instead of killing it, Samus just takes a leisurely stroll with it back to the ship. It's a really cool subversion of expectations. You totally expect to have to kill it, but the game doesn't even give you the option to. Again, it's a baby, come on! And it's not like saving it is gonna have any repercussions or anything. An oddly peaceful end to a game about committing genocide. So yeah, that was Metroid 2 Return of Samus. It wasn't bad or anything, but it's still pretty rough to get through. And the main reason for that is the same as the first game. There was no map, which makes it easy to get lost. The decision to make the game more linear definitely alleviated that, but you'll still get lost. There's no way around it. You practically need a map to enjoy this game casually. Even if you gave the game a map, there's still the repetitive nature of it. You do the same thing over and over. It gets old, especially with a weak soundtrack. And just like last time, the only reason why I was enjoying myself was because I'm a massive Metroid fan. If you aren't, don't bother with OG Metroid 2. This game has two remakes. Pick one. But hey, it's four bucks on the 3DS eShop if you're really that curious. This game really tried to do some cool things, but the technology still wasn't there yet. The first two games are two peas in a pod in that sense. They're both archaic, but ahead of their time. There's some great games here, it's just that they clearly didn't have the hardware to be great. So what happens when they make a Metroid game after the technology is there? Well, let's just say third time's the charm. Until then, take care, and I'll see you all next mission.